All right, Hever, let's learn another shtikul from the Gvuras Hashem, from the Heilige Zedem, or I'll be proud. So, and I'm showing you where you can find it. If you use Safari, if you use the app. So the third one, the third Tari here, let's learn. Bochor hu yisparach bol Pesach v'hoidiya masav v'voy oilam. So that God chose this night of Passover to make known his deeds to all those who pass through the world. Hakir es shmoi poilamai, to make his name recognized in this world, as he took his people out from Egypt. And we see this concept clearly in the fact that the Torah said, the scripture said, the Exodus from Egypt as the most fundamental foundation, the root of everything. It's really a central concept. In Judaism, mitzvos har bo b'shvil ha'yitziyah. Many of the commandments come because of the Exodus. Sh'al yodam yia le'neinu yisoydazer. And through these mitzvos, through these commandments, through these precepts, our eyes should be illuminated. to this fundamental concept of Anselenum Balgimai. And it should never pass from us, this concept of the Exodus. K'may Mitzvah Sukkah. For example, there's a precept of the tabernacle, the Feast of Tabernacles, the way we build a booth. Shama Torah, the scripture tells us in Leviticus 23.43, L'ma'an yedu seichem Ki basukos hushavti es bnei Yisrael bohitzi oisam meretz Yisrael b'Yisrael. In order that your future generations should know that I caused the children of Israel to dwell in these tabernacles, these booths, when I took them out from Egypt, to Av Shabbos, even the Sabbath itself. Now, my boy, it says in Scripture about it in Deuteronomy chapter five, verse fifteen. You shall remember that you were a, a slave in Egypt. Similarly, the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread of course, obviously, come to commemorate the exodus from Egypt. But really, the truth is, every one of our holidays, on a Mekad Shem Aimim Zeichel Tzius Mitzrayim, when we recite the Kiddush, on all of the festivals, we say that this is in memory of the exodus from Egypt, and also on Shabbos, the Sabbath, we also say that it's in commemoration of the exodus from Egypt, Zeichel Tzius Mitzrayim. And then we add to this that we have an obligation to commemorate the exodus from Egypt every day. The Talmud in Brachos, the Tractate on Blessings, Benedictions, chapter 12, uh, page 12b, says, says this based on the passage in Deuteronomy, in order that you should remember the day you left Egypt, all the days of your life, and the Rebbe Leezim and Azariah, According to Elizabeth and Azariah, as we, we quote this passage in the Talmud, in our in the Haggadah, that the obligation is both day and night. All of this it, it comes to indicate exodus from Egypt itself. 
Quotes me in Nisim Shalosu Yitzia. In addition to the miracles that took place during the Exodus, we just have to, we're always mentioning the Exodus. Who you said, who amuna, that's the foundation of our of our faith. All of Nivna Kol, and everything is built on this, on this foundation. Af kinisim neflois ein mispar as hakadosh baruch hu, who im im am Yisrael. Even though God did tremendous, innumerable miracles and wonders with the Israelites during the the uh, Exodus and at other times in history as well. The Torah never tells us to commemorate any of these other commandments. You know, there's no meaning, even if it says that, you know, you're supposed to remember the manna, but we don't have a day set for the manna. Now, in Hebrew, manna is mun. And I know someone pointed out that every week we have Monday. But in any event, uh, we don't have a day to commemorate the manna. We don't have a liturgy, even though I know the Sephardim have, you know, the Ashkenazim have the six comm- things we remember, and the Sephardim have the ten things to remember. And some, some Hasidim uh, like to say the Sephardish away. But anyway, it's not an actual, it's, it's a Kabbalistic concept. It's not an actual obligation, you know, to, that it's not one of the 613 mitzvahs to remember the manna. Or many other miracles that took place throughout Jewish history. We don't have, uh, many of them took place on Passover. We mention them in the Haggadah and some Mizmiris, but we don't. Uh... Hold on, let's pause this. We don't have a special day. We don't have constant mes- mentioning in our liturgy the way we have for the Exodus. Avkil fi asogus bnei adam kitzvei hasecho nira kiyesh davar sheish by shinai tevim and hagi shalaylam and even though. When in the small mindedness of the human beings, it seems like there is such a thing that there's a change in the nature of how the world runs. People could see such a thing. Something they might think is a bigger miracle than the exodus from Egypt itself. The Torah doesn't, doesn't agree with that opinion. We see that the Torah set the Exodus from Egypt to be a, the the main idea, the 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 foundation of our faith from these proofs that we brought above. Because so many things in the Torah come to commemorate this foundation for example the Mechilta brings in Parshas Yisrael when Jethro says and Jethro heard all the things that the Lord did to Moses and to Israel's people he that the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt that's Exodus 18.1 so the Mechilta, the Medrash says that God, that, Mo, that, that Jethro, Yisro, he saw that the exodus from Egypt was equal to any other miracle, all other miracles that God did any other time. So we see from this scripture, our sages made a homiletical understanding that the, the exodus from Egypt is fundamental to all of the... Maybe we should wait till mommy gets home so we can put this into our car because we're not quite ready yet for it to come inside yet. Miracles of okay. Egypt. Hold on. How do I pause this thing? 
So the Medrash say Chetoyv Yitzis Chemikur Barzel. Medrash brings Deuteronomy chapter four verse twenty says, and I took you out from the iron crucible. Kishem Shazavi Poishet Yodai Noitol Zav Minakor. So he says a goldsmith puts out his hands. And he, so this, this is lighting, and he takes out the gold from the crucible. So Medrash says, just like the goldsmith takes the gold out of the crucible, that's how God took the Israelites out of Egypt. And then the next comparison is like, a, a, a fetus in an animal that's uh, the same thing that it's this is um so then it's compared to the the baby uh the baby cow that's in the that's in the womb of the mother cow but, uh, and then the the shepherd or the farmer or the veterinarian goes and and takes it out that's how it means in, in Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 34 it says did God ever try to take one nation out of the midst of another nation. That's what the measure says. So, Viter. So, we explain with this, with this Medrash, two big things that were in Egypt. I'm not going to read the Hebrew. Just, we'll just say the English. One is that the Egyptians were taking hold when they were taking them over with a strong hand, that they shouldn't leave, the Israelites shouldn't leave from their domain, their dominion. The second was that the, Jew, the Israelites themselves, that they were in Egypt, they felt so connected to the Egyptians, they felt like they were part of Egypt. They didn't feel ind- any independence. Any, any independent existence. Therefore, first one says that the Israelites were like the um, the gold that's in the crucible. What does it mean? That the fire works on the gold in the crucible and it separates from the dross, and from the gold, until it's very difficult to take it out. That's, and it's so hot that you can't, you can't put your hand in there, right? So that's how it is. The Jews in Egypt, the Egyptians worked so hard on them, and they subjugated them so much, and they controlled them so much, it was very difficult to take them out. And then the second thing, where it says that the Israelites were like a fetus in a, in a, in a cow that's connected to the mother. It means she's secondary to her. It's, it's the halacha's uber yerachimo. Uh, uh, an uber... Uh, an embryo, a fetus, is considered to be a limb of the mother. And this is what it says, In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 21, it says, like we say in the Haggadah, we quote this scripture, We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. The Lord our God took us out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And this is explained very much in depth in what we say in the Haggadah. 
By Abadim Hayino, a farmer of Mitzrayim, we would say, Noshem Yed Chazaka, we just quoted, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord took us out with a mighty hand. And that which we say, that just like the goldsmith puts his hand in and removes the gold, means to say, it's as if he would take the gold with his hand and not with tongs. That if, if that were the case, it's not a big deal to take gold out with tongs. And so to the Medrash says in another place that like the goldsmith who takes the gold out with his hands, not with tongs and not with a cloth, not with an oven mitt, something, we mean from this that when the, the gold is in the crucible, it's being smelted, it's being melted, it's so hard to put your hand in there and take it out. You're going to put your hand into the crucible? Because there's such a hot fire in the crucible that is able to purify and cleanse the gold. So no goldsmith is going to put his hand into the crucible to take out the gold. The fire is the thing that's separating the goldsmith from the gold in the crucible. And there's no connection between the goldsmith and the gold. So too, were the, uh, can you turn that off? I'm, I'm recording. The Israelites were in the, when they were under the control of the Egyptians, and the Egyptians were working hard on them, and they were under the dominion of the Egyptians, the Israelites were under the Egyptian dominion, until that for this reason, the Israelites felt no connection to God because they were totally subjugated under the hands of the Egyptians. And when God wanted to take the Egyptians out of Egypt, he connected himself to the Jewish people, to the Israelites, and they were under the subjugation, under the dominion of Egypt. This is as if uh, a goldsmith put his hand into the into the crucible to take out the gold and the gold the fire in the crucible is something that is separating him from it this is what the it says in Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 20 it says that God took you out of the iron crucible in order to be for him a, a heritage this is so difficult because the Egyptians, they were like a, a, a crucible. That, that's how much they conquered the Israelites. And from the second side, that from the side of the Israelites, when it says, Did God ever try to take up one nation from the midst of another nation? And it says, From the midst, from inside. Kerev means like, an internal organ, right? Meaning that the, the Israelites felt in the, to the Egyptians like as if like uh, they were a, a, an embryo, a fetus within the mother's womb. Because the Egyptians were, the, the Israelites were in Egypt like a, like a, 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 a an embryo like a fetus that grew up, that came into existence in the mother's womb. And the end, they came out like the perfectly coming out and, and coming into existence. That's how the Israelites, they were growing and they were developing in the midst of the Egyptians. What's that King Kong versus Godzilla thing? Until... They uh, became totally complete. Can you turn the sound off? I'm almost done with this. To be 600,000 people. This is the completion of the Israelites. In order to be 600,000. And then, meaning fully formed, like the same like a, like a nine-month... Uh, nine month pregnancy it's this type of thing and they uh, 
that's that's how they became developed. And the tr- the proof for this that the completion of the Israelites was by a number by of the population number is because when they left Egypt, they were six hundred thousand. That's what we f- find in Exodus chapter twelve, verse thirty-seven. And when they when they uh, fell with the sin of the golden calf, there were 600,000. And in Parshish Bamidbar, 600,000. In, uh, in the book of Numbers, chapter 1, verse 46, Parshish Pinchas, also 600,000. Book of Numbers, chapter 26, verse 51. From this we see that there's the form of the Israelites, their perfection was 600,000. And if they got bigger after that, that's because of the blessing that they were blessed with. But there was like a fully formed baby, nine months of uh, pregnancy. But the perfection of the Israelites is this number that's worthy of them, 600,000. And the reason is that it's known that six is a, f- a perfect number because you don't find something that's perfect without the number six. What are you doing? Don't climb on that. Because this is the point that it's one. And it's missing something because it doesn't have... No! Because it doesn't spread out at all. And the the line that has... Uh, that spreads out in length, that's even more perfect because it has... It spreads out in the length. I mean, you have a point, and then you have a line. You know, the point is, you know, not even a dimension. A line is one dimension, right? But that's but one dimension also not perfect, because uh, the the extension of a line is only in one direction, and it doesn't have any width. It only has length. So something that has both width and length. That's even more perfect. I mean, that's two dimensions, and because it has, it has, it, it spreads out in two in two directions, become four, the four sides. That's that's a square, right? But it has no depth. But for something to be really perfect, is because it goes in six directions, what? meaning it has it has three dimensions meaning up, down, and the four directions of uh, uh, north, south, east, west, and up and down, that's six. So then you don't have anything that spreads out more than these six directions. So therefore, the scholars of philosophy said that if you have three dimensions, that means six directions, that is what's considered to be perfection. Therefore... Something that has six sides is perfect, and that's why the Jewish people were 600,000, because the number six is a perfect number that you can't add to that uh, another dimension in this realm. Of course, we know other dimensions that exist uh, according to quantum physics or whatever. And that which was this number 600,000, and not 600 or 6,000, is because it needs to be all three levels of numbers, meaning 6 and 100 and 1,000. And that that's why, if it was only 600, it would still be missing, because it wasn't the 1,000, which is even greater. And if there was 6,000, it would be missing the 100, which is between 6 and 1,000. Therefore, that perfect number is 600,000, because now... You have all the numbers, because this number of a a myriad, it's only found a little bit, that 10,000, and you don't need this number, you just need the 100 and the 1,000. But in a place where it's possible to count the 10,000, we don't count it, rather, by a 1,000, meaning... This number of reboy means it's it's only in relationship to the to the number thousand. The myriad is only ten thousand. It's called ten thousand. It's a it's a because it's a greater number, but it's not 
like this number is connected because this is a, a really not a perfect number. And it's not a number of perfection, it's just a number of addition. And the addition is not perfection because the perfection is that it, there's nothing to add and there's nothing missing. So the, the myriad, the 10,000, has a, an addition because it is called, that's what's called, reboy means addition, the myriad. If you say that after this you have three numbers, the, the one's place, the hundred's place, and the thousand's place, why isn't there something in the tens place? That's not a question. So we're going to understand because there's a difference between the tens place and other numbers because you, you don't say six ten. You say sixty. And so so you know meaning you say six hundred but you don't say six tens you say six tenths that's different but you don't say six tens you say sixty it's a number by itself so that's also we don't say six tens hundreds thousands you don't count like that you say sixty hundred or sixty you know or six hundred thousand you know you don't you don't count the number ten with the six. It's it's oh it's the same in Hebrew and it's the same in English, right? In Hebrew it's shishim, and in English it's sixty. So like when we count a hundred with the six, you say six hundred. Therefore, it's impossible to say six hundred thousand. And but this number six tens it has no place to say that. So therefore, the perfect number is six hundred thousand. And these are very clear things. And when the Israelites were 600,000 people, they had their perfection. And then they left Egypt like the like a baby when it comes to nine months uh, in the womb and then is born. And furthermore, because the Jewish people were this one people, it was worthy for them to have this number of 600,000 because this is a number that's a perfect number.